thank you for coming today. Appreciate it. This is uh, a little bit more of a meatier conversation and uh, information that we're going to be going over today than the typical, hey, cybersecurity presentation. So I'm excited about this because this is also a lot more of where the rubber meets the road. Uh, and uh, well, just quickly, introductions, Byron with Technologize. Uh, and I appreciate Community First Bank and HFG Trust to allowing us to host this event here. Uh, and uh, as you can see in front of you, you got some. We've got a little bit of a worksheet, so this is intended to be not just a presentation, but a little bit of a workshop. So it will require some of your brain power a little bit as we get to a couple spots. I promise we're not going to be too complicated today. Uh, so I'm going to go through some slides and some some high level items about incident response planning, what to prepare for. How, how, what's, what's kind of the life cycle of an incident response plan and the, and the framework around it, a little bit of the why, what's the purpose and what to expect out, expect out of it. <clears throat> and then we'll have plenty of time for some Q and A and things like that. Uh, you know, Byron here, I, I am not a, a, I'm formerly an IT person. I haven't been doing it every day, so I'm not very technical anymore. However, uh, this is a lot more of where I work in my realm and working with clients from all different levels of uh, small businesses to, to mid-sized businesses that are very complex and have a lot of regulatory compliance needs. So uh, again, really excited to have you here. I hope this will be informative and helpful for you and your organizations. You know, this is just a little bit of the beginning if, if you don't have any, well, let me ask real quick, who's, or, who's got incident response plans for the organization? I, I'm thinking a couple of, them, of you folks, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have something here. That's great. So you might be able to have, give some input and some feedback on what's been working well, what hasn't worked well, and, and, uh, and you might learn a few things too. So those who are still just needing to get started, awesome. This is, a, this is where you need to be. And I hope the, the resources here that we provide will help you get that going. Here we go. Let's see if I can get this, uh, there we go. All right, just a little bit more about me and Technologize. Technologize is a professional technology services company. We provide professional IT services, managed IT and cybersecurity services, as well as information security and regulatory compliance uh, consulting. Technologize is the uh, is SOC 2 accredited, and what that means is that we are audited by a third party every year. And that validates and ensures that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing and that we're protecting, that we have the proper securities and controls in place to protect not only our organization, but that will also, uh, in the end, protect our clients' systems as, as well. So that's an important part. Uh, we always encourage that everybody is audited by a third or reviewed, audited by a third party. Uh, that's how we are held accountable to what we're supposed to be doing. All right. Okay. So uh, a big part, I don't know if you've heard the terminology, but a term that I really like is cyber resilience. And the definition is, is right here, nice and big letters, the ability to anticipate, withstand, recover from, and adapt to adverse conditions, stresses, attacks, or compromises on systems that use or are enabled by cyber resources. Now, the reason I like the term cyber resilience is, and those of you that are in the IT, I'm sure this is already a term you're familiar with, uh, is because something's gonna happen. This is not a conversation about if, it's a conversation about when. So when it does happen, what do we do? and how much preparation that we do now can mitigate the impact and how quickly can we get back up an operational if we get hit or attacked by something that is ransomware or something that is a, a significant or severe a threat. So cyber resilience. Here's a couple stats, <clears throat> some information, recent information, so FBI, reported recently that uh, 
uh, in the last five years, there's been an approximate 27.6 billion reported losses. That dollars and losses, that's that's huge. And then and what, what's astonishing to me is you look at the numbers in 2018, and then you look at the numbers of 2022 and how dramatic the annual increase has, has where we've arrived, right? Because in 2022, that the losses were reported losses again, uh, were at $10.3 billion in losses. And oh yeah, we were talking earlier where you had even mentioned that, uh, that um, most people don't even report yeah, and most people don't even report that that there are issues, right? So we don't know the the losses. Sorry, I couldn't remember your name. Um, okay, so here's a couple other things. Ransomware hit 186, 186, 860 critical infrastructure organizations in 2022. Uh, these, and here's kind of a neat graph of what those critical infrastructure uh, organizations are, or what industries they're in. You know, healthcare, public, manufacturing, government facilities, just gives you a, kind of a visual of what's happening, what's going on out there. We got a couple, some critical infrastructure folks in here. So government facilities. So it's it's happening. We all know it's out there. And then uh, recently, you know, there's China's kind of pretty active in the cyber front right now. I mean, they always have, but that's kind of come up a couple notches right now. So that's something we have to be aware of. Uh, and again, same same conversation where we were talking about, well, if, if China or another nation state wants to come after us, there's not much we're going to be able to do about it. It's just, that's why we're, we need to have a plan. So why do we have an incident response plan? Well, for me, I like to, I have the, anytime I talk about incident response plans, I always think of when my kids were a lot little, a lot more, a lot younger, and we would go through our family fire escape plan. If there's a fire, what do we do? You know, you, you touch the doorknob, is it hot? You touch the door, is it hot? Is it cold? You know, if there's smoke, you know, you crawl on the floor. And what they loved the most though was going through the actual drills and practices. And they loved it because we would, okay, kids, let's, crawl through the windows and jump out the, you know, jump out the window and, and go through all that. And they absolutely loved it. But what was value about that process is we had a plan. This is how we got out of the home. This is where we would meet up. If something were to happen, this is how you tell, you know, where, you know, if there's certain threats or vulnerable risks, then this is how we respond to that. And then, um, and, and now that we've practiced it, they feel more confident about going through that. So in the event of a, an emergency, you know, they're not, hopefully not panicked and, you know, and tragically just don't do anything and stay there. So, so this is the, just for me, real base level, that's, this is why we do the incident response plan. And even the most, because... <laughs> I don't know how, how many, some of you may or may have not have been in the situation where you've had a cyber event. And, uh, and I can tell you, having spoken and worked with folks that have been in that situation, it's stressful. There's a lot, there's panic. There's, I'm, I mean, a lot of, it's, there, there's almost a paralysis to some extent on what do we do? And it's because even the most seasoned professionals can find themselves in that paralysis state and unprepared. So the plan helps us have, okay, here's the plan, let's walk through it. <clears throat> so incident response plan provides a clear roadmap and it provides the response team with basic guidance what to do immediately after a cyber event has been identified and occurred. Okay, so here's, Okay. Yeah. So have a, have a, so the only sure shot way is have a plan of action that everyone is aware of. So that's another thing. Everybody needs to know what the plan is, right? Because if mom and dad know what the fire escape plan, but we don't tell the kids, it doesn't do anybody any good. So have a plan. Everybody knows what it is. Remind everybody what to do. And it's been rehearsed by key stakeholders. 
The idea is to mitigate that chaos and the confusion and make sure that everybody knows what's going on. So the messaging, the communication is happening. Couple things, because what I get a lot is that, well, an incident response plan or cyber incident response plan that, oh, that's gonna be super technical. It shouldn't be. There's some technical elements and tech, technical lingo, but, it, but the plan should be easy to read and easy to understand by both technical and non-technical people. Uh, the, it needs to have clearly defined steps and well-defined communication channels. What the incident response plan should not be, it should not be too complex, too technical, or too long. I'll tell you, that's in my world, in the policy world, I, I know Craig knows what I'm talking about. Some of these documents can just get outrageously out of control. And at, at that point, maybe to meet regulatory compliance, okay, let's put that one aside and that meets regulatory compliance. But for practical purposes, it cannot be long and complex. It has to be simple, straightforward. Here's the, here's the concise components to help you in that time of need. Oh my gosh, I get all the time, and Earl over there talks to a lot of people too. Hey, do you have an incident response plan? What's your incident response plan? Those are kind of the questions we throw out there. Oh, my plan is to call the IT guy. Nah, that doesn't count. That doesn't work. How would you IT? I mean, you, you guys in the IT departments, what do you think about that plan? You're like, like, no way, Jose. Not doing that. That's not a plan. In fact, if I'm a business owner or CEO of an organization, do I really want to put? Uh, um, <laughs> how much confidence am I going to have in that kind of plan? Right? Call the IT guy. Well, I hope it works out. You know. All right. Uh, why do you need an incident response plan? Ensures business, financial, and operational continuity in the face of cybersecurity incidents and data breaches. Uh, coordinated response efforts allow for uh, stakeholders, I already mentioned this, all to be on the same page. They're aware of their responsibility. That's another really important thing is that everybody knows what they're responsible for. Uh, it reduces the panic confusion and keeps everyone on the same page. And even more so, it avoids dangerous missteps and making matters worse. I have seen that over and over again where, oh, the, Hey, call the IT guy. The IT guy starts scrambling and panicky to do stuff, or, um, or even the CEO starts shutting stuff down or doing things like that. And then I'm like, no, you're making some huge mistakes. It's going to make it worse, or it's going to increase your liability. All right. So here's four phases of the NIST incident response lifecycle. First is prepare. Second, identify. Third is contain, eradicate, recover, and less. And then last is lesson learned, lessons learned. And the other thing that we're, we're gonna go over just a little bit today is tabletop drills. Um, so some of these slides, I'm probably gonna run through a little bit because I'm anxious to get on a little bit on the workshop stuff. But a clear plan provides that, uh, provides and makes you evaluate potential risk to your business, where your vulnerabilities, and where your critical assets are at. Not just technical, but also uh, HR processes and uh, other employee processes as, as well, financial processes. You know, may, and it forces you to think about, well, if and when, or when this kind of thing happens, what are we gonna do? What's, how are we gonna handle this? So even just thinking through the process and putting something on paper really allows you to be much more prepared. Okay, so here's here's just some examples of, so what, we, <clears throat> what we'll do is, there's some example plans on the table here, but if you want to email me after this, I'll, e I'll email you electronic copies of a sample plan if you'd like to have a copy. We have, Technologize has our plan, and then we have a, a sample plan as well. You're welcome to get a copy of that. But here's a couple components. One is of an of a incident response plan is what are the threats? 
what are those vulnerabilities? What do we need to be looking for? You know, next is we talked about roles and responsibilities. So what's the president and CEO do? What's, you know, who's, what's his responsibility? What's finance do? What's their responsibility? And really just defining and having that clarity for everybody is incredibly valuable. Here's another thing, just real simple. So what if something does happen and you have to send a message out to all your clients or customers? In the heat of the moment, you're going to sit down, uh, uh, you know, sorry that this happened, blah, blah, blah. Have a template ready ahead of time. And, and, and there you go. And you can have, so the, the sample that we have out here actually has two or three different examples, depending on the scenario and what's happened. And it doesn't have to be complicated. Just a quick little, hey, we're aware of the issue. We launched an investigation. Here's what we found. Because oftentimes, even what, I've, the, what I have seen is there's a lot of embarrassment around, uh, you know, something that's happened. But people are really good and forgiving, for the most part, when there is good communication. Everybody knows there's cyber events now. It just happens, right? What we don't appreciate is when it, there's no communication, nobody tells us what's going on, and or it feels like it was trying to be hidden or swept under the rug. So the best thing you can do, or one of the good best things you can do is have good communication, not just with customers or patients or... Uh, <clears throat> or even vendors, but internally within your own organization. All right, so here's, here's a quick workshop part. Ooh. What are your, where do you think your biggest risk is at? I would, so on page two, there's just an open box on this checklist. I want you just to put a couple notes. We'll just give it a minute. Answer these three questions. Where do you think your biggest risk is at? What are some uh, some non-technical controls that are potentially missing? And do you uh, and what backup business or operational processes do you have? I mean, paper or paper processes or what do you you know what's what's some of the pieces you have in place? So just take a minute and think about that. What are and you think and I'm going to chat just a little bit while you guys are noting things. And you'd think some of this stuff is obvious, like, oh, yeah, well, it's, it's email or it's the server. Um, but, what, but when you really think and, and ponder about it, there's some elements there that, and that can really be beneficial for you to understand, have clarity. What do we really, really need? What can we survive without for a little bit? And what do we absolutely have to have? Because at this juncture, when you've, let's say, fell victim to ransomware, everything's encrypted, you can't operate. At this point, you're looking at, do we have a life raft? Can we save the business? Can we save the organization? Can we protect the data? You know, or do we... <laughs> yeah, because I hear all the time, oh, well, we'll just recover from backups. Well... That's great. How do you, are you sure your backups are not also compromised? Or are you sure, you know, when's the last time you did a test recovery from backup? Uh, there's a lot of false sense of security. Uh, I can share a couple of, a couple of things that uh, we do here. I'm Craig from King of First Bank. Um, so I think the answer to, or one of the answers to the first question here is, where do you think your biggest risk is at? Um, cool. Our biggest risk in our eyes is definitely the employees. Um, it's, it's the email compromise, the business email compromise. Ransomware gets in that way. Uh, I've been in IT 16 years now, and that generally is where the risk is at. Um, we've had some other incidents as well over my career. Uh, I think the previous slide was the DDoS attack. Um, but there are lots of things that you can do to control that. One thing is uh, block block Russia. Block, block. <laughs> we do literally here at the bank, do block the entire world except for in UK, which some of our email comes through. 
and um, in the U.S. Of course, they can use VPN to get around that, but um, that uh, that uh, covers a lot of the attacks. Well, and that's a, and, and and right there, what you mentioned, Craig, about the G, well, whatever you want to call geo blocking or conditional access. That's huge, and so many organizations don't have that still, and that's I, I, that's one on one. A block if you're not working out of an international company or international country, block it. You don't need it because that's where they're coming from. All right, so here's a couple other questions, but I I can uh, I'm not going to go over those right now, but. Uh, you don't need to put notes, but just things to think about. Who's going to be on the incident response team? Do you have identified who, who's, who's going to even be on the team? What critical data do you have that you need to protect? And what controls do you have around that data? What's the critical software or cloud services that you have? Do you have contact information on paper somewhere where if you need to get a hold of them? And then key vendors. Because oftentimes vendors are important part of the recovery process and the incident response, whether it's forensics or uh, investigation. So uh, here's a core part is identifying the issue. A lot of times is it, and I'm going to skip to the last bullet a little bit. What, how severe is this issue? Is it, is it, is it an incident? Or is it an actual breach? You know, it, and you need to understand the severity of, of the incident. And so here's another piece. What's the terminology is really, really important. Is it an event, which is a potential to become, but it's not confirmed to be a cyber incident? So is it just an event? Or is it an incident where there is an, uh, when there's an explicit breach of a security policy that requires corrective action, uh, but it's not an actual breach. So no data's been compromised. But a data breach is an incident in which sensitive information uh, has been intentionally or unintentionally released to a untrusted or on unauthorized person or environment. And Because you hear about the breaches, because everybody says cybersecurity breach in the news. That's what you hear about. But there's a lot of other stuff that goes on that leads up to to a breach, and we and it's important to understand: is it really a breach, and and how do we control and measure that? So part of our plan and part of the sample plan is a severity matrix, so you can gauge the threat and and the impact. Okay, so here's another quick workshop uh, questions. <clears throat> I want you to just spend a minute, write a couple of these answers down. Who reports an incident? Who's who, yeah, who, who, who throws up the flare? Hey, I see something going on. Who's supposed to do that? Well, and then who do they tell? Who do they report to? What's that, that process? What's the communication process? And then when they are communicating, what do they communicate? Oh, I, you know, what, what, what do we need? Is it just... There's something fishy going on here, or what's what do we expect in that communication process? And then also, who determines the severity? Because I'll tell you, in my business, if you talk to one person versus the other, they can tell very different stories and say, oh, this is really... And the, and the other guy's like, eh, this is no big deal. I'm like, okay, well, let's, we got to figure this out because we got to be, have some clarity around that. Everybody's got to be on the same page. And that is actually kind of a funny conversation to have about, around these questions because you do, you hear so many different takes on it and interpretations. That's why you put it on paper and that's why you have it documented because then everybody, it's, it's, it's formalized. And I just, you know, the hint is just don't call the, call the IT guys still not the answer. Contain, containing 
uh, effectively controlling the impact of the attack. So here's where I see a lot of missteps. Uh, there's the, because when there's a cyber event, we're reactive. You know, we're in that panic mode. Let's start shutting things down. Let's start restoring from backup. And, and I'll, I'm going to comment on that here in a minute. But containment is specifically having a strategy in place to stop the, the spread, to stop the threat from getting uh, bigger, worse. Because deleting everything, for example, oh, I've got deleting everything is never the right answer because you could you lose valuable evidence and increase your liability. Or shutting everything off, I could say the same thing. You don't just... It, cause human nature is, oh, quick, shut everything down. I'm, you know, can't, you can't necessarily do that. There's a lot of risk and liability to doing that. What's the short-term and, and long-term strategic elements to, to the plan, such as which systems are you going to take offline or unplug from the network? What operational business processes can you put into place? And we, I kind of had a question on that earlier in the workshop. What's your, go, what's your backup? What's your plan B? What do you, how, do you, how do you handle that if your normal systems are down? So here's an example of common cyber incidents and responses. So the part of the plan is here's the description and here's the kind of the, here's the initial response. So we have, again, clarity on what the response should be. On these specific situations, is it malware, is it an infection virus, or is it ransomware? And there's a, and there's more in there. <clears throat> Containment, again, we just, we, we just went over that. Uh, it's just important because again, everybody will, will have different reactions in the event and we wanna make sure that we've standardized on what that response is. Myth, I can recover from my backup, let's get rocking and rolling. Well, one, we, we don't know if the backup's been compromised or not, but two, you, can't, you, you know, in, if like in the bank, if, if you guys have an incident, you're taking the equipment and everything, connect, disconnecting it from the network and setting it aside because there has to be time for forensics. You have to do forensics, you have to do that investigation. Typically a third party comes in and will do that, that work for you. But in the meantime, if you have to have to have your core servers or systems over here chilling for forensics, how do you get going over here so you can still do business? And that's the thing that you got to think about. So here's what you don't want to do. You don't want to just reboot. You don't want to just shut everything down and you don't want to ju just start recovering from backups. Uh, and you definitely don't want to just start deleting things. What you do is you simply unplug from the network. Yeah. So the threat has been contained. You unplug it from the network, <clears throat> whether it's a single device, whether it's a server, or just taking down the internet, right? <clears throat> because the threats from the outside typically, and you know, and, and if you have ransomware and it's encrypting data and it's in the process, typically it's 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 already gone, right? It's really it's pretty much near impossible to unless you have multiple branches, right? And, and it hasn't spread to different locations. Well then, yeah, that's disconnect from the internet, right? Cause you don't want it to go anywhere else. But if it's in, if it's in your building, it, it's gonna be tough to stop it. It's, it's gonna run, it's gonna go. So. Quick request to Doug. Mm -hmm. I, I completely did do not, un, or do, do unplug from the net part. But from a forensic perspective, if you leave it running, doesn't that end up destroying information on the system itself? Like, mm -hmm. Yeah, if ransomware is still running, it's going to be encrypting your files. Yeah. Right. So isn't, so isn't there an argument for shutting that system down? The problem if you shut it, if you shut it down, you lose some of the, 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 the memory and the cat core things and processes and things like that that are needed for the forensics okay. and for the investigation of other either identifying what the threat was and what the attack is but also uh identifying potential recovery steps okay. uh, and and really what it comes down to when you've gotten ransomware 
it's not just, it's no longer a conversation about, oh, we got to keep the data safe. We got to protect really what we're having, the conversation and why we're having the, because the incident response plan is not a technology plan. It's a financial and business continuity plan. Right. And that's where I'm referring. That's why you do it. Because now we're not, the damage is there. The attack is happening. Mm -hmm. Now we're looking at the financial viability of the organization okay. and, the li and the legal and liability component of it. And I would add to that. I think um, Byron is absolutely right. Um, you have to find that that recovery point. Um, you can kind of pretty much say if you, you have ransomware here, and it's those systems are compromised already. Right. So you have to get the that where that state recovery point is. Right. And then recover from there. Right. Right. And, yeah. And that makes absolute sense. I was just thinking from from a forensic preservation stand, mm -hmm. standpoint, like. Is there any argument for trying to freeze the system in time, quote unquote? But was, was... I mean, it's a fair question, and it's a common, and, and it's a common question, and it's one that you know we've even had to consider as well. But ultimately, it all typically comes to the same conclusion. Okay. No, you leave it, because again, because it comes back to what, because what's going to happen is lawyers and insurance companies are going to say, "What did you do?" And, and if you say, well, we shut the computers down, they automatically assume the worst and your liability increases big time. Okay. So you say, okay, we identified the issue. We contained it by disconnecting it from the network. Here it is. Yeah. And, they, okay, and they'll say, okay, awesome. The insurance company will say, okay, let our people dig into this or let the, the forensic people dig into this and they can do their investigation. Because the problem is, is when you're, we're, we're rebooting, shutting things down, it flushes logs. You lose all that RAM or that memory that's in there uh, on active processes. And again, they, they, they just increases your liability. Got it. Okay. Yeah. But, but you are right, Daniel. I've heard it both ways. So mm -hmm. with Energy Northwest and their cyber, or they're, they're trying to do SOC as a service. And so they said, do not unplug it. I mean, they said contain it. They yeah. Didn't in the analogy, but they do not want to even put it in there. Now, there I was going to say, yeah, there, there are actually layers where you can contain without unplugging. And that's a, a lot of what we do as well. Uh, go ahead, Craig. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, give the VLAN an off or, yeah. or segment it somewhere. So it's just running the, the, I've been in situations where the forensic team does go through all of that. And they're pretty amazing at what they can find. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, Jordan, you you mentioned it was Energy Northwest. Is that who you said? Yes, because they were trying to partner with the uh, utilities and mobile yeah. municipalities to for people who couldn't afford like a twenty four seven knock. Mm -hmm. So make it a, a more viable, affordable, affordable. Yeah. Well, you hit it. To you know, look at logs twenty four seven. Well, you hit a good uh, a good point there because a lot of small businesses can't afford even some of the tools that would allow for that containment, or they don't have the technical skill set. And and that's one of the, uh, the <laughs> there's another term. Have you heard cybersecurity poverty line? Have you heard that term? Not yet. Ba I have that you should investigate that. Look into that. I did not. I wish I did because it's a really cool term. So, yeah. what, what is it the cybersecurity poverty line effectively is kind of what. We're touching on right now where the cost to secure for small and mid-sized businesses is is prohibitive mm -hmm. effectively so i can't afford to to secure my organization like energy northwest mm -hmm. or i can't afford you know just because it the cost increase so where do you where's that line you know, and, and this is why this incident response planning is also incredibly valuable because you can evaluate your risk and the cost to mitigate as well and determine what makes sense for your organization. Because you know what? I, I'm not Energy Northwest and I may not, but as long as I understand where my vulnerability is at, I have more control and I can be more confident in my response. One of the things that we do, since we're a little bit above the poverty line, um, we're not Energy Northwest either, but we can't afford a cybersecurity team, but we outsource our cybersecurity to um, 
uh, a third party we send all of our longs to and so they're looking at those 24 7 in real time yeah. um they sift through you know they may create 180 incidents uh a month that's about what they do and then they send about 30 of those to us to, for us to investigate mm -hmm. but that makes me sleep really well at night because we're sending on billions of logs uh to them so they can look at those real time and i put it in the contract that they have to find that safe recovery point that we could recover from in, in case something were happening. Um, and it's not that expensive. Uh, relatively speaking, yeah. absolutely not. And it's well, cause we do the similar thing, right? And uh, you know, we, we have third party, the third party auditors, and then we also have uh, the third party SOC, you know, that's looking at the logs and things. And it's huge difference for, for me. I mean, I, I feel I sleep a little bit better at night. We do get feedback from them on a regular basis. And it is, a, it is more money than I spent five years ago on cybersecurity. Oh, heck yeah, absolutely. The cost is going up. However, it still allows me to operate and, and not succumb to this poverty, cybersecurity poverty issue. Fun comes in though, if you're a small business and you're working with the feds, mm -hmm. they move everything down to your, and you made you well below the hobbing rod. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and it's about, cause you, you've got to meet, you know, all those requirements will down you because you can talk that to, to the feds. So that we are working with, it, but I, I, I'm, I'm seeing that. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's just, so it, it can trying to get to that point when you're below the poverty line can make a break because that's and mm -hmm. that yeah you have to yeah no no you're right i mean uh, you got you can destroy a business but if you if you're below the line you can't afford it. you got president biden you got state legislation you got you know uh yeah they're all setting legislation out there you and they got all their cyber security requirements cmmc or dfars and yeah, yeah. So, and and the problem with in in that realm that you're bringing up right now, and Daniel, you're probably familiar too, is the uh, they're it's a moving target. They still haven't figured it out themselves, and, and then so you caught you spend money over here. Oh wait, next year they changed it. We gotta adjust. We gotta, and so it extremely frustrating, extremely frustrating. Yes. Yeah, so I, I I get it, I get it. Um, and that, that, and that will be a challenge. But the good news is there's still a lot of fundamental things that are very affordable. And because the other thing is you have to meet those requirements, but but you also, if, if you show that you're doing and making efforts and doing some of these things and you did your, your, your because nobody's ever going to have a perfect system ever, right? There's always going to be gaps and vulnerabilities. The fact that you're doing something will give you much more and, and giving it a good effort will give you much more legal recourse than if you were completely negligent and just didn't do anything. So that's kind of where I, I, it would require a little bit more of a bigger conversation, Gary, on that side of things, DOD, DOE. Uh, but the cause is not lost. I, I, there's a lot that small businesses can do that is affordable. The hard part is navigating what the heck to do. Because it's like me and taxes. Don't ask me anything about taxes. I'm a complete mess when it comes to figuring that financial side of it out. What do you think? The, uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> what do you think is the one biggest thing that a small business could do that's relatively inexpensive? Email attachment filtering. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I, I was, there's just a couple things for small businesses. It's uh, MF multi factor authentication. Multi-factor authentication and training, awareness training. Uh, and then, so those are the top two. And then I would go, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yep. Is that, I mean, that's where the, the easiest breach is to then go there and click on something, muscle attack. And when we were talking just before we started that uh, one of the, we do a lot of the fishing campaign trainings. We do, <laughs> Matt, Matt's back there sh shaking his head. <laughs> Um, the, uh, we do a lot of the regular ones, um, when the pandemic started, uh, we, we got really pretty good as an organization that have maybe less than 1% actually click. 
Um, but then we threw out a something that was about the pandemic. Um, and I click here to see the new pandemic policy. It was like 50% of our people who had been through multiple trainings clicked the link. So one of the things that's going around now is the um, uh, banking crisis, which we're fine. Um, but, 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 but people really, really were fine. So that email I got that you guys were, was. <laughs> but, but it is something that could trigger people because it's been in the news a lot. So um, you might talk about that with your folks. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's two programs out there too. Like we just had a free cyber assessment um, the last two weeks because of the breach that happened on the electrical grid on the East Coast. Yeah. So then that's how the government reacted. Man, I attended free government trading out in I think, Idaho Falls. So there is some free options available. Yeah. They're really the hardest challenge, the biggest challenge with this whole thing is time. And prioritizing it right because that's what it comes down to and and uh, being in the it world it's always if there's still just a lot of reactionary stuff we got to do this or we got to implement the latest technology we got to do this merge this migration we got to do whatever it is right it, it's the it's that proactive let's pu put us you know a plan in place or let's do the phishing tests or let's do you know that's and oftentimes that's why I, I see uh, cyber or infosec information security is a completely separate operation than IT, and and in small business and even midside business they, that kind of gets jumbled together, and that's not a good thing because the cyber and the information security just doesn't happen, gets neglected, right? And so separating out those roles and responsibilities are are would be preferred, not always possible. Well, unfortunately, the only thing that changes that poverty line is an incident. So <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the fastest way to make that change, isn't it? So when we are man, bit, there was a local incident and cause you know, we all go with that narrative or happened to me, we just uh -huh. got pretty, no one wants ours though. But when it happened locally, then we reacted. I mean, luckily it wasn't too late, but, and so when we just had our cyber security assessment last week, we're actually in good shape compared to other utilities. It's good to hear because you never know. And so you have some. Yeah. Yep. And, and that's. Utilities. Yeah. They're ignoring it. Yeah. The critical infrastructure. You bet. <laughs> ah, weird. I know. Crazy. Okay. So we're uh, running hot on time. So I'm just going to click through a few more things and then we can um, wrap it up for additional Q&A if we need to. Cyber insurance is another vital aspect. We talk about financial viability and liability. Uh, you, you need to make sure that you have the right policies in place. Another thing that you want to make sure is if you do have a, an actual incident, a breach, it's been identified that you contain, but you stop and contact your insurance company. Because at that point, if you intend to file a claim, they will dictate the process and next steps. And they will have to have their experts and forensic folks get into your system and help with the eradication and the recovery. If you don't stop and you move forward, start recovering from backups or whatnot, uh, it could impact your claim and uh, as previously stated, increase your liability and legal risk. Uh, the other component that's really important as, and tied into this is only authorized agents of the insurance company can proceed beyond that, that point. And that's another big pitfall I see with a lot of small businesses. They have their IT company or their IT guy and it's jump right in and get us back to business, get us, get us working again. And then they go to file a claim and guess what? No go, it gets denied. Or, you know, so really at this point, we're, we, we've got to protect the financial liability of the business. That's why we have insurance. So make sure you do have the cyber policy so you can have that, that protection. 
Okay, uh, for the sake of time, I'm just gonna skip through a couple of these. Uh, recover. So a couple aspects here, eradicate. You know, again, this is just going through and understanding what caused the breach, plug in those holes, taking care of those vulnerabilities, ensure that all the malicious content is uh, removed from the network or removed from your system and just hunt for backdoors. Because one of the big things they like to do, the bad actors, is they like to put in backdoors uh, beach hold, beach heads, whatever you want to call them, where if they lose one access, they can turn around and get access to another way. Then there's the recovery, getting things back online. Uh, have the gaps been remediated? Test, monitor, verify the systems are working. And then uh, the important stat that I wanted to share with you here is that if you've had a breach, statistically, the likelihood of you having a second breach or more is very high because you've already been victim and oftentimes the holes or gaps are not entirely filled or they've implemented those back doors and they may not do it next month they may chill and say eh, we still have access we'll get in there six months from now and kind of do our uh, do our damage again and i have talked to several businesses where this has been where this has happened and and they're besides themselves. We just had ransomware six months ago and or a year ago, and how come this is happening again? Well, you missed some critical steps in the recovery and eradication process. So statistically, what does it say? Two thirds are hit more than once of those who were compromised the first time. And then 80% of organizations that paid ransom were hit a second time. That's a pretty high number. And that's a real scary number. That's why we, again, we want to have the plan and we want to do our due diligence. Okay, uh, just a couple more questions that I would suggest you go through. Um, what is your recovery time objective, for example? In reality, yeah, you want to say, ah, we need to be back up and going as soon as possible. Okay, well, let's put some measures to that. What's some numbers on that? financially or operationally what's what's the real tangible information there pencil out what a recovery process might look like even if it's i mean you don't have to formally do the incident response plan just start with just freehand what would that look like what are the things we need to consider that's it's like drafting an essay for a school or something you you have to put multiple drafts, multiple thoughts into this. <laughs> Probably could. Oh, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> lots of incidences. Uh, okay. And then uh, also what's vital is, is having that, what's often called post-mortem or two weeks later, sit down, review everything. Look at what happened, why it happened, and how the plan worked, and then what you can do for next time to improve the plan and the process. And so here's a couple checklists, some ideas. There's like a CEO checklist. Here's a technician checklist, also included in the sample plan. Uh, but the other thing that I know we've taken and we've kind of gone off script a little bit, Craig. No, you're fine. It's, I think it's been, hopefully it's been helpful for you guys. Uh, one of the things that we I wanted to reiterate, and Craig and I talked about this uh, at length, is the need to do what they call tabletop exercises. So for those of you who, who aren't familiar with that term, it's effectively going through a scenario where everybody's sitting at a big table like this, and we walk through a simulation or scenario that, hey, you got ransomware, what do you do? And then you walk through the plan and say, okay, I do this, and you communicate, because you'll find, and we have found just through simple things, like our power goes out. What do we, you know? Oh, crap, we didn't even think about that. Oh, shoot, we forget, didn't consider that. And so just sitting down, you work out some of those bugs, and does it, does it hold water? Um, and it kind of puts it into muscle memory too, right? Where you've, if you go through it on a even an annual basis, like, oh man, we, we walked through this, we did this, I know what to do. So it puts it into, the, into muscle memory. Uh, and, I, and, and for us, because I 
because we work with a lot of businesses and organization, I'm pretty passionate about this because I see the negative impact and effect and the stress that it puts, because it's not just uh, stress on the business, it's stress on the business owners and their families. It's stress on the employees and their, you know, for, for them and their families, because it, it is, you know, it's a big deal. And my hope is that through this process, you're able to take away and apply some of this incident response planning steps or uh, and ultimately, ideally, have a whole plan in place for your organization. The comment that I wanted to, to reiterate, too, based off of what Craig said, is one of the hard things and challenges that we've had in the IT or cybersecurity world is executives, leaderships have, uh, by default, oh, that's an IT thing, or that's, a, that's, that's them. I don't know anything about technology. I can't do anything there. But as a CEO or as a manager, as a leader, I need to understand that, no, this is a CEO thing and this is a manager thing. This is not an IT thing because we're talking about business risk and IT is just a component of that. So when you do the day tabletops and the drills, it is vital and most critical to have the CEO, general manager, whoever, the executive leadership all involved. Otherwise, you're kind of wasting, not entirely wasting your time, but you're not getting the value you should. Any questions? You said you can... <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you just shoot me an email. Um, oh, I'll bring it up there. So there's, there's actually a few things that I'll recommend. One is, uh, Craig spoke to it earlier, just to get a, a basic evaluation assessment on where you stand on a threat, threat against ransomware. We have a ransomware self-assessment tool that's available to you for free. You can go to that link right there at the bottom, or you can just email me and I can just send you the link. Uh, and the same thing with the cyber incident response plan. It's because it's like 20 pages and uh, happy to share that, give electronic copies, but I just don't want to print, print them all out. You want to add that to your own organization. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then those, yeah, so four things. Ransomware self-assessment tool, cyber insurance coverage. I mentioned that earlier. Uh, incident response plan, and then tabletop exercises. Do those four things. That'd be a lot better shape. Even if you just, you know, it's not going to happen overnight, but if you say in 2023, I'm going to do this, or in the next 12 months, I'm going to do this, put it on your calendar, make it goals and just say, okay, by this month, I'm doing that. And just write it out, get these four things done. And you're going to be sailing way above the average Joe. All right. I want to thank Brian Byron for doing all this. He put a lot of effort into it. Thanks again, guys, for coming. Appreciate it. I love this. I love the small group. I love the questions and the participation. Thank you again.